Hey everyone, I will be presenting on MR Neurography Approach to Traumatic Brachial Plexus Pathology. MR Neurography is a non-invasive imaging technique for dedicated assessment of peripheral nerves. Thin section high resolution sequences are performed that are dedicated to optimally increase the complexity of nerve tissue signals. Being able to view the nerves help the physician to localize the site of nerve injury and diagnose the underlying etiology. They are typically high titubated sequences along the high signal nerve to stand out from the darker, fat suppressed background soft tissue. MR neurography can image nerves anywhere in the body. It is most commonly used in the diagnosis of abnormalities of the brachial plexus, lumbosacral plexus, thoracic outlet, and the sciatic nerves. Now, coming on to the imaging of the brachial plexus, brachial plexopathy, traumatic and non traumatic, often present with vague symptoms. Clinical examination and electrophysiological studies are useful, but they may not localize the lesion accurately. MR neurography, with its multiplanar imaging capability and soft tissue contrast resolution, plays an important role in evaluation of the abnormal brachial plexus. The aims and objectives are to study the normal brachial plexus anatomy, to evaluate the role of MR neurography in diagnosis and characterization of traumatic brachial plexus lesions. Imaging technique. Patients are imaged in the spine position with arms at their sides using both cervical and body coils. A combination of various sequences in different planes is used for optimal assessment of the plexus. These comprise both 2D and 3D sequences like axial T1, axial T2, fat suppress, coronal T1, stir sequences, space, sagittal stir, and sagittal 3D T2 space sequences. Scan area extends from C3 to T3 level. The T1 weighted images delineate the anatomy. The T2 weighted images reveal the signal abnormalities within the brachial plexus. Stir images provide uniform and reliable fat suppression. IV gadolinium is administered in patients with tumor or mass lesion and is generally not administered in patients with traumatic brachial plexopathies. In patients with traumatic injury, in addition to the previous described protocol, sagittal T2 weighted images are obtained through the cervical spine, followed by axial T2 weighted images from C4 to T2 lesion levels. In addition, a 3D gradient eco sequence, GRE, 3D GRE sequence with thin slices is obtained to look for the nerve root origin. Coming on to the normal anatomy, anatomical assessment of the brachial plexus starts with evaluating the spine, the spinal cord, and the roots of the spinal nerves. Within the canal, the ventral and dorsal nerve roots exit the spinal cord laterally. The ventral root carry the motor fibers, while the dorsal root carry the sensory fibers. The ventral and dorsal roots course into the neural foramen where they merge to form the spinal nerve. Distance to the neural foramen, the spinal nerves divide into the ventral and dorsal rami. The brachial plexus is formed of the ventral rami of the spinal nerves of the C5 to T1. The ventral rami are also known as the roots of the brachial plexus. Now this is the coronal T2 star image showing the roots of the brachial plexus. We can identify the T1 nerve root by its passing inferior to the first rib. The C8 nerve root passes above it. Above it is the C7, C6 and the C5 nerve root. The roots of the brachial plexus course between the anterior and middle scalene muscle adjacent to the subclavian artery. The C5 and C6 combine to form the upper trunk. C7 continue as the middle trunk and the C8 and T1 join to form the lower trunk. At the lateral border of scalene triangle, each trunk is divided into anterior and posterior division. The medial cord is formed as prolongation of the anterior division. The lateral cord is formed by the anterior division of the medial and the, middle and the upper trunk and all the posterior divisions form the posterior cord. The medial and lateral cords course anterior to the subclavian artery and posterior cord passes posterior to it. The cords run posterior to this pectoralis minor muscle and subsequently give up the terminal branches. The roots and the trunks are supraclavicular in only location while division are retroclavicular and the cords are infraclavicular. The roots extend from the neural foramen to the edge of the scalene triangle. From the edge of the scalene triangle, we have the trunks. From scalene triangle to midclavicular level, we have the divisions. From the midclavicular segment to the anterior coracoid process, we have the cords and after that we have the branches. This is a gyital T2 weighted image showing the anterior at the middle scalene muscle with the trunks of the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. Now coming on to the pathologies, the traumatic pathologies can be divided into stretch injury which are neuropraxia, pseudomeningocytes and the root aversions. 
The common cause of brachial plexus injuries are road traffic accidents and birth palsy. The two most common clinical syndromes are upper brachial plexus palsy, that is the Erb's palsy, and the lower brachial palsy, that is the Klumke's palsy. The upper C5 to C7 roots are more susceptible to postganglionic injury, whereas the lower C8 T1 roots more commonly manifest with preganglionic injury. Preganglionic injury. A preganglionic injury usually consists of an avulsion of the nerve roots from the spinal cord. A diagnosis of root avulsion is important because it directly affects treatment and pertains a worsen prognosis. MRI may show discontinuity of the ventral or dorsal nerve root from the spinal cord as a direct sign of root avulsion. Pseudomeningoses. These are formed due to extravasation of CSF fluid through tear of the perineal sheet. They are seen on T2-weighted images as fluid signal intensity lesion at the site of nerve root avulsion. Other sites of preganglionic injury include the spinal cord edema near the level of the root avulsion. Now these are oblique, sagittal and axial T2 weighted images which reveal the pseudo meningocele at site of left C7 and C8 nerve root avulsion. Postganglionic injury. Traumatic brachial plexopathies may manifest as a focal caliber change of the nerve trunk, loss of fascicular architecture, nerve trunk or fascicular discontinuity. Neuroma formation, perineal scarring, or nerve signal intensity abnormality at MRI. Neuropaxic injury as seen at T2 hyperintense signal in the roots, trunks, or cords with or without enlargement. Nerve rupture are seen at discontinuity in the neural structure. Associated findings of denervation edema in the muscle may also be seen. Now, this is a coronal chair image which reveals swollen, hyperintense divisions and cords of left trabecular plexus, suggesting of a postganglionic neuroplexus neuropraxic injury. Again, another coronal stir and sagittal T2-weighted images showing the nerve rupture with fluid collection around the retracted nerve suggestive of a postganglionic lesion. Sagittal T1 and stir images showing postganglionic injury with fibrosis encasing the cords of left brachial plexus. There is also denervation edema in the supra and interspinous muscles seen as ill-defined hyperintense signal on stir images. Brachial plexus injury may be associated with injuries subclavian artery due to their anatomical proximity to each other. Also, post-traumatic pseudoaneurysm of subclavian artery may present with delayed brachial plexus paralysis due to compression of the brachial plexus. Now, these are coronal T1 and stern images which reveals post-traumatic pseudoaneurysm of right subclavian artery causing compression of adjacent right brachial plexus. The preganglionic and postganglionic lesions the preganglionic lesions are generally avulsion of the nerve roots at their origin, and postganglionic lesion may be lesions in continuity or nerve rupture. Preganglionic lesions are usually treated with nerve transfer to restore function of the denervated muscles. Postganglionic lesion in continuity without disruption of nerve fibers have good prognosis and recover spontaneously with conservative management. Postganglionic lesions with disruption of nerve fibers are treated with surgical repair, that is, nerve grafting, with good results. Conclusion. To summarize, knowledge of the anatomy and proper planning of the scan are essential for complete evaluation of brachial plexus. Various traumatic pathologies affecting it can be optimally evaluated by MR neurography. Now, these are the references. Thank you.